and uh, I'll try and get this rebitted. My apologies for this. There we are. Okay, can I declare the meeting open to the public and remind members that the meeting will be recorded and ask members to know all mobile phones must be switched off as they interfere with the recording. And also can I remind members to, where appropriate, through the meeting to declare uh, an interest. Apologies. Uh, I had received an apology from Jonathan Craig, who has a hospital appointment uh, just this morning, and uh, Danny has had to step out uh, to, to attend something else. Uh, any others? No? Okay. A uh, couple of items in relation to Chair's business. Briefly, uh, the 50th BT Young Scientists and Technology Exhibition. I think we had a very useful and interesting uh, time at the exhibition. Can I thank uh, Karen for the work that she did in all the preparations, and also to Chris and Sean for attending along with us. And I think it was an outstanding event. I just checked with Karen earlier. There is a list, and I'll get it sent to members of all the schools in Northern Ireland who either were successful in terms of place or highly commend it. And it is, I have to say, impressive to see how well schools have done. The project that we visited in relation to St Mary's in Limavari uh, was a winner. Uh, and it's, it's no wonder, given the wee girl who made the, the presentation, she was outstanding, nearly as outstanding as the wee boy from the school in, in your own constituency. He was, I tell you, I, I want to track his uh, future because I think he'll, he was very impressive. Uh, and I just think it's, it's an excellent event. Now, it's what we do in terms of uh, uh, moving that forward. Obviously, we have a meeting with some of the winners at the forthcoming STEM at School event on the 29th of January. Uh, and our members content that we would write to those schools to congratulate them on their achievement. Uh, Sean and Chris, do you want to make a comment? That was the comment I was going to make, because uh, the, apparently there's over 2,000 applicants for that BT Young Scientist. There's 550 directly chosen for that exhibition. So those people are all winners, and they all deserve mm -hmm. a, a congratulated letter from us. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I, I was found myself out canvassing actually in the evening when we got home, and went to a door where they had been um, to the Young Scientist. He was from Wellington College. Uh, why was the Milky Way Milky or whatever yes, it yeah. was, and I believe they actually got an accommodation yes, or whatever did. it might have been, but the father says they couldn't stop talking the entire night. This is the buzz between them and their friends was just fantastic, and I think this is what we've always said about STEM. Yep. That's the sort of reaction you get whenever you have involved in them sort of projects. So whatever we can do as a committee to help build on that, we certainly need to look to get more schools yep. involved. Um, whatever it is I suggested on the day, perhaps next year we could maybe do our committee meeting at the event itself. Um, BT said they would be more than happy to assist with us. They had a whole host of meetings taking place on that week in side rooms and everything else. It may be a way to showcase the event to important stakeholders we want to bring to the event too. So I think that we will ask Peter to try and look at how we can uh, get more involved in terms of that event. Uh, and also, I think after the STEM is cool event, I think we need to consider uh, how we, as a committee, encourage all, more schools to participate. And also, the one thing that really stood out for me is not only the, the level of the entrance and the enthusiasm and all that, that, that goes on and the buzz that's in the place, but in the primary sector, because you had post primary and primary, there wasn't one school from Northern Ireland in the primary. And it goes back to the whole issue that we've discussed in this committee in relation to where science is placed in the curriculum. And I think we really do need, and we could make an invaluable contribution. Here, here's where we're going to have to have a discussion uh, so that we are, and I think the, the, the STEM is cool event will maybe help to condense some of this for us in our thinking. Remember there is an event that also takes place here in Northern Ireland, which is the Sentinus event. You have all the discussions that we've had around STEM. You have the BT Young Scientist. You have a number of other smaller things that goes on. We need to sort of try and work out in our mind where all those things sit. It's not a case of either or. It's a combination of all of those. And I think BT Young Scientist places 
a huge emphasis in the right place at the right time. It plays an invaluable role, and we just need to make sure that our schools are making the best possible access to it. So I think that there's work, ongoing work. So if, if we're content, we would uh, discuss this again after our event on the 29th of January. Okay, happy. Thank you. Thank you. An issue, members, that, that I think. Uh, we should maybe seek clarification from the department, and, and it's, it has sort of it happened, and it, it, it uh, went back into the ether again. It was the issue around Bloomfield Collegiate, and they recently requested change in the designation from a voluntary grammar to a controlled grammar. The reason cited in the media was a <coughs> sizable and increasing budget deficit, and I we've had nothing really from the department uh, on this, and I would propose it right to the department and seek clarity on this matter, including the status of Bloomfield's debt, the ownership of the school property, the governance arrangements, post-redesignation, as the viability audits give limited and varying information on the financial viability of other voluntary grammars. And I would suggest that we would just seek clarity from the department on this issue, because clearly it's one school saying we, we were happy in this home, now we find there's a difficulty and we're moving to be in this home. And just what's the implications? And so we're clear in our own minds. Have we enough? Thank you. Yep. The deputy chair and the clerk and, and any other <coughs> members that are available. I don't think there's been. But uh, on Friday coming is the uh, briefing from Claire Shawbridge, who led the OECD uh, review team on the evaluation and assessment frameworks for improving school outcomes. That a briefing pack was circulated uh, to. Uh, members earlier this week, and you will be aware that we are due to receive the department's briefing on the subject on the 19th of February. Now, if there's any members still wanting to attend that, Peter? Uh, Chair, just, just a quick <coughs> one. Um, the, uh, Karen uh, circulated the uh, a members' pack. There is a, a document in it called the Country Background Report, which was written by the department. It's just if, um, say, members who are newer to the committee, if you ever want to know anything about education in Northern Ireland, it explains it all. It's a very, very clear document. Um, um, it says all sorts of uh, interesting things about education. And, uh, we can send it to you again if you don't have it. Okay. Thank you. Is that report on paper, or is it on here somewhere? Um, there was an email sent with a link to, the, to where it is on the right. system. It's in there somewhere, yes. <laughs> it's in the it's cloud. In, it's in there somewhere. It's in your cloud, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, if you want, certainly Karen will be able to, to get it for you. Sir. I know where that's at. Sure, this is the same paper. Famous last week. No, that's good. Okay, uh, the draft minutes of the meeting of the 8th of January uh, is at pages 46 to 52 of the pack. Contempt. Yeah. Okay, members, we'll then move to the first. Uh, presentation, which is an area-based planning. And you'll find the clerk's cover note at pages 55 to 73 in your pack, uh, in which there's a paper from Professor Colin Noakes uh, at pages 74 to 90, and other papers, including a note of the committee's informal briefing event with area planning stakeholders held in June of last year. Uh, today's briefing will be recorded by Hansard, and we welcome to the committee uh, Professor Colin Noakes, Professor of Comparative Public Policy at the Institute of Research and Social Scientist of the Ulster, uh, University of Ulster. Mr Mark Baker, uh, Programme Manager for the Centre for Shared Education at Queen's University of Belfast. And Mr Alistair Stewart, who is the Secretary of the Shared Education Programme at Queen's University of Belfast. Gentlemen, you are very welcome. Thank you for taking the time to come uh, to speak to us today and also to Professor Noakes for the paper that he has provided for us. And Colin will ask you to speak to that paper and any other contributions that Mark or Alison wants to make and then members will have undoubtedly questions for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thanks for the invitation and offer to share our views with you around area planning. Although the paper was specifically about consultation process, I think we'd maybe like to open up the discussion with a little bit of background to that, Chair, if that's okay. Yeah. I mean, just yesterday, I think uh, the Minister made a statement which is very relevant in terms of, of the discussions uh, that we have been having around area planning. And he stated it's clear that area planning is complex, 
multifaceted and requires coordination, discussions and pragmatism. And one of the points that the Minister referred to specifically was just the difficulty in planning authorities bringing forward interrelated and linked development proposals. And I think one of our experiences is that uh, that is uh, especially true where you've got you know, a multiplicity of managing authorities coming together to provide composite plans for specific areas. And I mean, the other point that the Minister made, I think, again, which is part of our experience, is that every school tells its own story. And I suppose um, we wouldn't want area planning to come down to uh, the point where every school has to tell their own story. Otherwise, I don't think we'd progress at any particular speed. But just to give you a little bit of context, I think, in terms of uh, the area planning process itself and then our, our specific interest in it, Obviously, um, the process has been ongoing now for over a couple of years, uh, rooted in the Putting People's Foot uh, First Sharing Our Future document in September 2011. And I think you know, the whole basis of that was the Minister was arguing and the Department that they had inherited a pattern of provision that's both unsustainable educationally and financially. And they quoted the figure of 85,000 spare places 150 excess schools in a system which had just over 320,000 pupils. But importantly, and this is a point that we'd want to stress here, I think the, the overriding objective of area planning here was about raising education standards. And I think part of the rationale for area planning was to create this network of strong and sustainable schools. They went about that, as you all know, through the audit system and they looked at schools that were experiencing stress under those three criteria, quality of education experience, enrolment trends, and financial standing of schools. And the results of those viability audit, audits then formed the basis of, of the area plans themselves. I suppose one of the questions, one of the initial questions, and we've a few more to come, I think one of the initial questions that we would raise is whether in fact area planning is really an institutional response to raising standards and whether in effect, whether in effect that is a, a good mechanism to tackle raising standards. So we think that whilst we might go towards a network of sustainable schools, just offering a broader curriculum choice in itself may not be the totality of, of what area planning is, is about. So again, as you know, it was supposed to be based on the six principles which drew on the sustainable schools policy. Um, the three I've already mentioned, but it seems to us looking at, at area planning as an as overall exercise. The, the other three that didn't seem to feature in area planning, which is the strength of links to local communities, accessibility and school leadership and management were essentially uh, ruled out of area planning as a process and for us those are important components. In fact, the Belfast, the Belfast Educational Library Board very specifically said based, uh, they, they based their audit on quantifiable robust data and they didn't include anything else that they, they regarded as subjective so they focused specifically on, on the, the, th the three criteria. A problem, I think, in looking at this, and I know just reading some of the Hansard uh, reports previously, you've questioned officials about this, is was there any particular weighting ascribed to those three criteria? Were they all considered equally? Um, and the standard kind of response, I think, was that uh, officials were saying, well, they didn't attach any particular weighting to them, and that the area planning process, to use their words, is an iterative process. Now, again, I think one of the suggestions that we have or one of the questions that we have is to what extent can it be iterative if some of these decisions actually involve say capital investment there's no opportunity if you've spent that kind of money to, to revisit decisions so we're just not sure about you know the standing of area planning as an ongoing process I think a second observation that we make on, on the process of area planning is that it's fairly clear to us that those schools which were, to use the terminolo terminology, red flagged, could, could become part of a self-fulfilling prophecy so, that's, so that parents mm -hmm. make in their choices of school if they see that kind of data in the public debate, and of course the media made a lot of that, then 
that could uh, significantly influence their choice in, in terms of saying, well, why should we send our kid, kid, children to a school which is potentially at risk? And I suppose um, a third observation that we'd make, and again, uh, MLAs have, have picked up on this as well, is that the whole area-based planning process was based on a needs model, which was intra-sectoral, which means that you know, the boards essentially based their conclusions on controlled schools, CCMS on uh, Catholic, uh, prior, Catholic Commission proposals and the integrated movement on their projections, which meant that in a way area planning actually compounds the status quo. Uh, so all cajolements from the department to come up with innovative, creative solutions uh, in a sense, we're doomed to fail because the institutional frameworks were embedded in the area planning process itself. So it seems to, it seems to us, I think, that whilst tremendously useful in, per, in terms of putting data into the public domain, that the trends in area planning seem to be towards the creation of large intrasectoral schools. And I think that uh, undoubtedly will compound the parallel school system that we have if that trend is to continue. And a needs-based model that creates projections up until 2025 based on sectoral assessment of those needs. So um, the specific paper that we circulated was uh, about the consultation process itself. And as the paper suggests, we have concerns about the whole process of engagement around uh, those draft plans. First of all, I think uh, the consultation has been hugely variable across the boards. Boards have done it very differently. Some have been very active. Some have been very reactive. Secondly, we think the response uh, opportunities for people to feed into that process were very formulaic. You're kind of closed down into a series of questions. Now, admittedly, there's opportunities for open responses, but most people went down that route. So I think that was a very narrow way to undertake consultation in that process. And I think uh, what's been interesting for us on the post-primary plans, because we don't know the outcome of the primary plans as yet, is to see the extent to which some of those consultees, their ideas actually appeared in the draft area plans. And in some cases, we know from uh, experience with individual schools that we won't name, that managing authorities actually acted as gatekeepers for those uh, proposals. So the, the idea of the minister that a lot of this would be bottom up, which we encourage, in practice, it seems to us that a lot of that has not happened because individual managing authorities have felt that this is a job for them at a strategic level rather than at an individual level. So it seems to us it's slight contradiction in terms of was this a top-down process driven by managing authorities or was it truly an exercise where schools could feed in into a consultation process and their views be taken on board. And although the draft area plans for post-primary sector are available, we're slightly apprehensive that that same pattern will have been repeated at the level of primary schools. So just, just to conclude, uh, Chair, it seems to us that uh, the core objective of raising education standards here seems to have kind of been reduced to looking at those three criteria, which in and of themselves we are not convinced that there is a direct causal link to raising education standards. We very much saw the hand of managing authorities in these plans, and in fact, you know, it's described in the paper as really draft area plans became a cut and paste exercise. You had plans from the board, you had plans from CCMS, some input from integrated movement, and essentially these were stuck together and presented to the department as composite plans. And I think you know, we need to be convinced that area planning, the area planning process will address some of the major <laughs> failures in terms of raising education standards, having parallel systems of education. So a few questions that we have about the process, of course we're not expecting you to answer these since we're here as, as witnesses, but a few questions that we have around the process is, I think there's a great uncertainty amongst the school population, Chair, 
where do their area plans go from here? I mean, the primary school plans have been with the department. I think it's the, end of, the consultation ended on the end of June. They've been with the boards, and I think they're now in the process of going to the department. You know, that's six, seven months ago. Schools are uncertain about their future. I think with the passage of time, the post-primary plans have actually become quite dated. Some of the data that was used for those plans is now significantly out of date. And I think if the department were to take action on some of those, schools would rightly challenge the validity of the data upon which those decisions are based. The other kind of few questions that we have is, it seems to us that, maybe this is an observation more than a question, it seems to us that it's a very crowded policy space there in education at the moment. We've got the review of the ETI, we've got area planning, we've got ESA, the common fund and formula, school closures, shared education, built in the United Community document. And to us, there doesn't seem to be any real alignment between some of these areas. They almost seem to be undertaken as separate processes in themselves. Yet there is, there is a, a, an interrelationship between some of these. I mean, I don't think, for instance, you can look at the Built in the United Community document without also looking at area planning. And whilst there are statements made that these policies do need to be aligned, in practice it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, it's always very difficult to do that. The other observation that we had is around what's commonly called the kind of super committee on area planning. It's very difficult to get information about what that, that super committee is doing and the extent to which it's in, informing decisions. And we would certainly uh, impress upon the committee the need for transparency and openness around that, that super committee and area plan, the extent to which it, it is incorporating these multiplicity of other policies that are in the ether. Obviously, primary schools are anxious about you know, what, what the, the fate of their schools will be under the primary plans, <coughs> and I suppose Finally, our, our observation would be that uh, it's our experience in dealing with schools that in many ways some of the schools are well ahead of the thinking of the managing authorities. So I think I maybe want to leave it at that on, on this colleague's one. Ms. Mark, uh, want to make a comment? Well, the, the only comment that, that, that um, I think Professor Knox has probably covered most of the areas is, is this whole idea that ultimately we have a very crowded policy um, area at the moment and the process of area-based plan planning is ultimately we have policy supporting the process rather than the process supporting policy and an example of that might you know might be last Friday's announcement by the Minister which many people will welcome around um, shared campuses um, shared campuses don't come out of the air-based planning process. Our suspicion might be that, in effect, shared campuses will be wedged onto the area-based planning process. And the suggestion will be, well, look, you need to have a look now at the potential of shared campuses or shared facilities and how that might create a true, not two or three different colour maps of area-based planning, but a true overlapping map. And it's, it's that whole idea of what is being led here. Do we have process which is leading the policy or do we have policy that is leading the process and I think that would be our concern and that's what we see on the ground. Awesome. I think that's very okay. comprehensive. I'm happy enough. <laughs> I suppose I think all of these things when we come to, to this issue it's where you start in, in this because it's, it is a crowded space but if we keep it focused around the issue of what the paper is based on and that is on the, the process of area plan and Colin, you make reference to the super committee. Well, we've asked questions about the super committee, the, the strategic body that's been given, and, and, and it's full of of mist. Uh, and there is obviously we I have a particular issue in that the, there's a disproportionate uh, allocation of people who sit on the body, despite the minister giving an assurance that the control sector body, which he has now withdrawn funding from, and ceased to have any funding as of the 31st of December of last year hasn't a place, but yet CCMS and NICE have two places. And the, the answers that we have received clearly indicate that that's the case from the meetings that have been held. I think that's unfortunate and I think that's, that doesn't help to build confidence in trying to bring everybody together. But in terms of, of and let's go back to this issue about the, the needs basis. If if, as and I suppose the most <laughs> prevalent one is really falling off from yesterday, the announcement in relation to East and South Belfast, 
But if you looked at what was what was suggested, and I know we don't want to get into the, the individual and you say of all of those schools, but the general concept, you had an announcement on the basis of development proposals. But how relevant were those development proposals to the issue of area planning, sustainable schools, shared education? You know, all the, the very the very points that you were making, and even one very simple element, one school was proposed to be closed, but yet in the Belfast board area there will be a surplus of places uh, in uh, the post primary provision, and we have one school named the Orangefield that will that will be closed. So it's it's a connectivity of all of those. I think we all are beginning to struggle. And I think it's a case study, probably, certainly in the, the case of Orangefield, how not to do it from the, the board's point of view uh, in the way that the whole process was handled. But the over, then the, out, the outcome, while it was very good for some, less good for others, but then there's a whole raft of other schools which are on the periphery of all of that and even included in the same area within other sectors. And they really sat and folded their arms pulled down the, the, the tent and said, well, as long as they're not coming and looking inside my door, I'm happy. That's not area plan. I mean, I can only agree with what you say, Chair, and I suppose our, our experience is that increasingly we are seeing that misalignment. Mm -hmm. Now, has area planning changed because other policies have come on board here? Or, you know, was it a process that was sufficiently flexible to take account of those kind of changing scenarios? But one would imagine that the department couldn't put in, you know, the huge amount of effort that they did on the East Belfast proposals for every proposal that came in front of them for other schools that were, you know, in similar circumstances where they felt that maybe area planning was proposing that they should close, yet they could make a very good case for why their school would be open. Because, I mean, if area planning was to mean anything, it was to mean a kind of a composite, strategic look at the provision of schools across Northern Ireland. Um, again, I don't want to uh, comment on, on the details of, of those schools, but as a process, it just seems to be uh, something that is now being almost left behind, where departmental officials moved into that space and said, we need to knock uh, two, two boards' heads together here to make sure that this is seen as, a, as an overall plan for that area, and we need to do additional work around the requirements of schools in there. If that doesn't supersede the area planning process, then I'm not sure what does. One of the things. <coughs> Sorry, Mark. Well, um, the only thing I was going to mention is that uh, um, Colin mentioned earlier the, this idea of self-fulfilling prophecy, and uh, you, you mentioned just then the idea of pulling down the shutters if you're a safe school as such. That's something we see reflected in a number of places where when you're looking at solutions that might include, you know, be they intrasectoral or between the sectors, um, of two or three local schools working together, if one of those local schools is safe, and the other two are challenged, in effect, it's very difficult for the two challenge schools to ask the school that is safe to actually work with them in some kind of federation model, confederation model, be that a shared model or not a shared model, but an area-based solution. And it's this idea of not wanting to put your head above the parapet, as it's been mentioned a number of times. Let's be quiet and this will go away. And of course, the suggestion is it won't go away because area-based planning is an ongoing process. But I think ultimately we've struggled in the plans yesterday and the document clearly st states that there was an issue between the two boards and it's there and it, this is this is a challenging process but if there's been an issue between the boards you can see how that is compounded when you include the boards and ccms in terms of the discussions and i think that's the process that's missing here and so what you've, you ultimately have is you have decisions that's almost based on an individual school basis. That one's a yes and that one's a no, rather than a true area-based planning process. And that's the process that's missing. Yeah, because it's really, so in a sense what, what, what we're saying is that it's worse than what you describe calling the paper as uh, partnerism uh, on the part of schools managing authorities, that we know best attitude. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it's really worse than that because it actually comes down, in some cases, as we saw yesterday, to even within sectors, there's an unwillingness to be uh, where the words pragmatic or whatever way you want to describe it. It is about as long as we fit that criteria that's in, say, every school a good school, well, that secures us that we are safe. So we really don't have to do anything other than what it says in that document, even though it may not relate to all the other things that's going on around shared education, area planning, and so on. One board that you were particularly critical of was the Western Board uh, on the way in which uh, it had simply just decided to go on ahead and do whatever it was doing. Is, is that... Is that more an example of a board which is listening to the lobby that's given by the schools rather than trying to implement what is uh, set out in policies from the department? I suppose the examples that we give in, in the document um, actually name specific schools where they felt aggrieved that they had gone to their individual managing authority, whether that was CCMS or the Western Educational and Library Board in this particular case, with what they thought were a response to the Minister's call for creative, imaginative solutions. And some of the responses that they were getting were, we, you know, to put it, probably to paraphrase it rather than, than, than tell you what precisely the Board of CCMS said, look, this is a bigger issue than your two or three schools. Um, we think you should leave this to us. So there was almost kind of a, a denial that schools would have a voice in this document because they were given the idea that uh, solutions that they would come up with were much too parochial. Um, they needed to be looked at uh, in the totality of the board or in the totality of the parish in the case of, of uh, CCMS, and whilst their views might be useful at that very local level, particularly in the Western Board, which is many rural schools, that in the totality of it, they didn't have that bigger picture, so leave it to the managing authorities that had. So I think many of them felt disappointed that ideas that they put forward did not feature in the case of the post-primary plans, and are concerned that maybe ideas that they put forward for the primary schools may not feature in the um, draft area plans coming out of the boards. And does that, does that compound, and obviously does lead on to the issue of the blockages that are currently there, despite, I think, a lot of rhetoric in relation to shared education? Because you have, in that board area, examples where there could be progress made uh, and discussions still ongoing. However, my fear is that very soon there's going to be a crisis in that board area with the flagship that is given as the example of how shared education will work and it will come about because there will be a retrenchment into this is what we own, this is what we govern. Uh, we own this and govern this. You really can't have a say into, and, and, and that will become a problem. How do we avoid what I see as a train wreck that's coming in regards to that particular process? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a very good example of misalignment of, of policies here. Uh, so you've got these schools who seem to be at the local level have brokered very good relations through the shared education programme, for example, and that there's trust and uh, confidence that they can move this forward. But when that's overlaid with area, area planning process, that has not been helpful for those schools, I think, in terms of taking those ideas forward. And that's what I'm saying. You know, you get a misalignment of whether it's shared education. I think also the common funding formula will present problems for those schools as well and perhaps stymie their efforts to become confederated, federated schools. But you know, maybe my colleagues can give you 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Colin said it. I mean, it, ultimately, the minister on the 27th of October made the statement that shared education should be part of the DNA of education moving forward. Unfortunately, the area-based planning process hasn't caught up with that. And the area-based planning process is ongoing now. And, of course, what you could, what you could quite properly say is that when area-based planning started, shared education wasn't on the policy agenda. We now have, and you know, I know this, the focus is not shared education today, but when you have key policy initiatives like shared education and you have a process that is running almost against it, entrenching um, you know, single identity schools which are to become in the post-primary sector, which potentially might be you know, a thousand plus, you are losing the opportunity for the benefits that come from collaboration between schools and in rural communities, the benefits that come from keeping those schools, you know, keeping those schools alive as such. But yes, it, again, it comes down to the basic point, which is we believe that ultimately the area-based plan process is now completely and totally out of line with what the policy agenda is. And maybe the big question to ask, which we've asked ourselves, is what do we want education to be like in 20 years' time? And is the area-based planning process supporting our journey towards that? Now, that's a big question, and it's not the question for today, but I think that we've, you know, we've had pushed ourselves in terms of where shared education should be. So is area-based planning supporting that? And I would suggest in Fermanagh potentially not, no. Okay, Sean? Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. And, you know, the thing that comes to me, I think, was about silo mentality. Do we not do you not think really that this I think I think we've got it wrong in terms of area based planning. We have to accept I think we really need to accept that and start again. Because in terms of the silo mentality we we have a maintained plan, we have a controlled plan, we have integrated, we have Irish medium. And then at another level we have um, at a policy level we have a shared education document, we have a United Communities document, um, and we have an area planning document. Do you not really think we, we have to learn from our mistakes and start again and really put pupils first? It's not start from the blank page all together because we've learned quite, we should have learned quite a bit how the area planning process, but is that not the place? And then the other point really is, does it not amaze you that um, learning partnerships and our further education colleges didn't seem to be a part? of this area-based planning, and many of our students at GCSE level go to their local college, and again, the shared education, etc. there. I mean, your proposal of, to use your word, start again, I think are, are probably radical, but you know, I understand the point that you're making, that we've seen this, if you like, incremental push towards more policies, some of which might have outlived their usefulness, some of them have that have superseded area planning. I mean, I think there's been, there has been a lot of learning in terms of some of the information and data that has been published, and, and that, that shouldn't be lost. But I think it probably is timely to say, so how, do, how does all of this work together? I mean, for, for example, um, and my colleagues will be able to speak to this better than I do, it isn't even clear to schools who want some advice about you know, how would they work together, how would they collaborate to sustain a um, federation or confederation or, or shared, uh, shared communities of learning. There's no word for them to actually go for advice in the boards or CCMAs if that is the case. Now, our point would be if this was all about, you know, putting pupils fo first, focusing on learners. Here you have schools willing to do this, but there's nowhere for them to go. So they end up coming to you know, people like Queen's and, and other projects and saying, please help us. Yeah, I mean, I think in the case, even where the, the, the post-primary based plans have suggested these number of schools should work together in this town uh, for, 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 the, for the betterment of education outcomes for, for all the pupils, when the schools actually accept those plans and go to the board and CCMS, say, okay, look, this is in black and white now. Uh, we had quite like to get on with this. There's no real assistance or support for them to do that, be that actual resource or even just advice and guidance as to how they would, how, how they would grow that, that, that particular partnership. And <clears throat> I think there's a bit of frustration there f from the schools communities that we would work with that, you know, uh, for good or for ill, these plans were written on their behalf. Uh, they want to take them forward. 
Uh, they're willing to take them forward. They've done a lot of work in the background with governors, with parents, with pupils. They recognise the benefits in some cases of, 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 of taking these forward for the pupils in order to, to offer an enhanced provision, a, a wider breadth of provision. But when they go to their managing authority, they can't get any support, uh, be, be that actual resource support or even advice and, and guidance. I mean, I think the issue with the FE colleges, I mean, there was a, 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 an element of the process that you know, asked about FE, but it was very badly responded to in general. Uh, and I think the role of FE colleges you know, in our experience, some schools would have difficulties with, 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 with FE provision, some schools really, really value it. But that's another area where, again, schools and principals aren't really consulted on about what they feel about it. Uh, and certainly our experience would be that some principals, maybe the majority of principals, would, would have difficulties with elements of that. But it, it should have been part of the process, and I think front and centre as well, a, a wee bit more. I mean, the, the, the point Alistair makes about the... Um, um, you know, groups of schools that now have a document in terms of air-based planning that says that they should work together. When they then approach their education and library board and say, well, you know, under the current budget structure, um, we do need a small amount of extra funding for transport. In effect, the answer is, well, no. So you're giving mixed messages to... And, and again, you know, I, we have a very complex process and we are in a process of change in our education system. I think we, we all know that. But you can't give mixed messages to schools. And you can't say to schools, yes, what you're doing is good. You know, United Communities, you're feeding into policy change, but there's no budget support for you in doing that, even when it fits into area-based planning proposals. So you know, there are mixed messages being provided to the schools. So. But is it not even worse than that? Because when it comes to area planning, I just checked, because I made reference earlier on to the number of meetings I'm in hell of the Strategic Area Planning Board. It was only on the 6th of November of last year when we had at the meeting the Employment for Learning. Dale, that's the first time. Mm. Now, they've had, they had a meeting on uh, the 6th of November, and I think the process, the first meeting that we have recorded is way back in April of last year, 29th, uh, sorry, the 8th of April. Now, despite a, a commitment given that Dell would be involved in the area planning process, it wasn't until November of last year that they went to the meetings. Now, what's happening? If I think, and I not name the schools or not name the area, but I'll give you an example of area planning, where you had one school who made an application to the department to enhance its uh, a facility within the school. If I name the facility, then the school could be identified. As a result of that being done, it has now been able to withdraw itself completely from the entitlement framework, which included three other schools in the area learning community. Mm. And basically what that school is now saying is, we're all right, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. We're fine. Yeah. We can do the entitlement framework, whether it's 18, 21, 24, 27, and you see our dependence upon the further and higher education college, you can close it. Mm -hmm. We don't need it. You see the two other post-primary schools? We don't really need to be involved. That's not the area planning. And now we have a situation where the Dell has a capital amount of money to spend, and they're telling me we have to spend this money. I have said, how does that fit in with the area planning? Oh, but we have to. We so what they're doing is they're, Dell's going to reorganise their facilities, pull together their colleges, get their house in order. You see, as far as anybody else is concerned, well, you have to travel to us, and then. Cost will come in and pupils will be disadvantaged. That is not area planning. And I think Sean's comment is a valid point to make. That it's, and I think coupled with your comments, Colin, that the information and the data that we're using is now so out of date. It, there is a real crisis now in terms of the implementation of any feasible area plan, and particularly in post primary. As I've always said, God help us when we come to primary, because if we've seen a dog fight, in terms of post-primary, it ain't nothing to what we're going to see in the primary schools. And I think that's why the department's been very slow at giving us any indication as to what's in the primary school area plans in terms of that process. Can I say something about the, in terms of the entitlement framework, yeah. yes. I mean, I think it, it's useful to remember, and I'm sure the department will point out very clearly, the entitlement framework is about provision. And in fact, clearly the document says it's not about collaboration. Now, in recent months, 
of course, there's been a, a slight flip in that the entitlement framework and area learning communities are being talked about as vehicles for shared education. However, when schools are judged individually in terms of viability audit data on their provision of 24-27, the incentive is for a school to deliver 24-27 on their own. And the moment they can do that, they don't need to collaborate. So if you flip that and you talked about area provision and collaboration as being the vehicle for that, you would then have true area-based planning. Um, and the potential for provision. But the, the message from the department, again, in the entitlement framework document is about, this is about your school providing 24-27. It's not about providing an area-based solution. So that's an example as well where policy needs to be amended in light of you know, wider policy decisions that have recently or in the process of being made. Chris? Uh, thanks, and thanks, guys, for, uh, for that so far. Um, around the point about empowering the communities and uh, to, to break through the gatekeepers, etc., uh, what more do you think can be done to, to empower the communities um, who maybe are seeking uh, that change? Uh, and just a second point, maybe to refer specifically to your example of Balnage uh, in the paper. Uh, it's, it, it's where I'm from, it, it's, it's born and reared, so I, I have a fair idea of the dynamics, perhaps, of the local town. And, or I agree with you on one point that. Um, when the principal sat down and decided that the uh, intra sectoral solution wasn't preferable, they would prefer another one. To me and to many people actually on the ground, they decided, yeah, okay, let's tackle the religious division, but let's walk away from socioeconomic division in that the grammar school doesn't have to, you know, get down and dirty as it say with the other high schools, but the high schools have to work together. And I think there was some annoyance actually in the local area that, you know, they want to see the socioeconomic division tackled as much as they want to see the religious divisions tackled. So just perhaps your point um, or, or some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think with Balnehenge, you know, we, we should declare an interest. We work very closely with, with uh, St. Cummins in the high school in Balnehenge. And, um, you know, the, 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 the two principles actually at the minute, never we're dealing with them, focus purely on what they can offer within their own two, between their own two schools. And in the last academic year, they've, they've, they've put on a, you know, a quite an impressive range of accredited activity that they couldn't have offered on a single identity basis. Uh, and their argument <coughs> excuse me, to their, to their parents and the governors is simply, we have to deal with what we've got now, and we can offer more if we work with that school around the corner. Uh, and you know, we, we can offer your, your, your kids' subjects which they want to do, which are useful. Um, in, in relation to our, our role and, and uh, with, with you know, the two schools in Assumption, I think we'd be very keen to see <laughs> that issue addressed simply because it would further widen the provision and I, we feel it would probably work both ways. Um, but I think that's an issue that, that, that the two principals in the non sector schools, at the minute, they're, they're firmly focused on provision within their own two schools and what they can do more between themselves to, uh, to, 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 to offer the broadest range of subjects and activities that will be of use to their pupils. Um, you know, I know that I think there's a number, a small number of pupils do go from the Coleman's up to assumption for certain, certain lessons, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of piecemeal and, and, and ad hoc. Uh, with regard to, you know, what else can be done? I mean, I think you know the board, the, the, the board and CCMS and Ballinhenge have got an example there, whereby it is written in black and white in the area based plans that, as you as you alluded to, there needs to be a Ballinhenge solution. Um, the two non-selective schools, in our view, have have really led the way there without a huge amount of support. Uh, we would feel maybe from from the board and CCMS, you know, for for whatever reason, um, and you're really reliant on strong principals who can, you know engage with their governors, engage with their parents to say, look, you know, this is why we're doing this. It might be difficult, uh, but the bottom line is it, it, it's, it's, for, it's for the education outcomes for your, for your pupils. And I, and I think that kind of leads on then to empowering communities. I mean, what we have seen is whereby at, at primary and post-primary, it has fallen to, to principals and governors to, to lead the process. Uh, and certainly in the partnerships we have been involved in, that has been, that, that has been key. Um, and I think we, we, we saw yesterday, whenever you, know, uh, you, you get a community involved and, and active and uh, bought in, you, know, you can uh, leverage significant change. Again, we had to say we're not terribly sure that there's a huge amount of support from the system to do that. You're relying on you know, individuals within school communities to take that forward. And I mean, ju ju sorry, Mark, ju just to add to that, I mean, sometimes there is a reluctance 
for individual principles, as they would see it, with their head above the parapet here. <coughs> in some ways, they might feel that that could have career implications for them with their managing authorities, whether it's an education library board or CCMS. So I think the principals that have done that and the teachers that have done that have been very courageous in terms of saying, we feel we've got a local solution. We don't want to be ignored. We want to have our voice heard. And we're going to be very strong in doing that. And sometimes we'll appeal to their elected representatives for support in, in so doing. I mean, I, I fear, and just in terms of your specific point about what, what more can be done, I mean, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement, and maybe implicitly the department did that when you look at the East Belfast uh, su suggestions. There needs to be an acknowledgement that um, boards and CCMS uh, don't want to be overly critical here, but you know, they do look through the lens of their own sectoral interest and where schools are coming up with creative solutions, they find that difficult to cope with. You know, they, they've been used for so many years of looking at schools within their own particular sectors that it kind of it's, it challenges them to reach beyond their sectors. Mark? I'll just say one, one thing briefly. In terms of empowering the communities, I mean, I, I've been involved over the last couple of weeks with... Um, going to some primary, some small communities that have a number of primary schools, mm -hmm. and they're, they're groups which can be intersectoral, sectoral, intersectoral, you know, just groups of primary schools where you've got governors and principals basically saying, well, what can we do? The problem is, if you have that, that collaboration, that discussion, that, that attempt to look at an innovative solution in an area, is being led by a document which potentially is about, or perceived to be about, closure. That is not necessarily the right environment within which to empower communities. Now, it will, will make activists work. But if you're looking at innovative solutions, what you want is an equal plan for within the communities. Because what you'll have is, and I alluded it to, uh, to earlier, you will have a situation where you will have one school that believes it's safe, but should be part of an innovative solution with two or three other schools. But the principal and the governors are saying, well, I've got, we've got to be very, very careful here because we've got a responsibility to this school. And if we lift ourselves up potentially now, we are saying, well, we too potentially could be under threat. So I think um, there are a lot of organisations, rural, rural communities that were being one that are involved in a lot of school groups and talking to them at the moment. But that gap is being filled by NGOs. So is there an issue around incentivising collaboration? I think there's an issue. Well, incentivising is one of the issues. There's always been that issue. And, and, and that's collaboration between schools within the same sector as well as schools outside, you know, a, you know um, an intersectoral um, collaboration. But, but there's also mixed messages being given to schools in terms of policy. I mean, the, the minister's statement on the 22nd of, of October in terms of the sharing being a collaboration, being in the DNA of education, that being, you know, cross-community and socio-economic sharing, you know, is a huge step forward. But you need policy now and you need the system to drive it. Area-based planning is not working in that direction. It's working in a different direction. Uh, and I think, as Mark says, where, when, when two schools, be it from the same sector or different sectors, do collaborate uh, at and this is post primary at a, at a credit curricular level. You know, the inspector you know, w w doesn't really recognise that. And, and to get to that point, the schools have to decide well, if you're sending people to avail of a subject I do, who gets the credit for the grade? Or in some cases, who takes the blame for the grade? Um, uh, you know, do, do, we, do we take an element of your AWPU uh, because we have got that child for a certain amount of hours per week? The schools have worked all this out on a local basis. Um, they have dealt with those issues, but it's not been recognised uh, by the system. So whenever you know, uh, you know, school A and school B can't say, "Listen, together we actually offer you know 27, 30." Uh, that's not recognised. Uh, and I think you know, incentivisation can be a lot of things. It can be okay, some sort of you know, cash incentivisation or resource. But I think that actual recognition that these two schools have managed to work this amongst themselves. I think that needs to be recognised, and that in itself is incentivisation. The system recognising when schools are dynamic and innovative, I think, is incredibly important, and maybe that doesn't happen quite enough. Well, cheers. Thanks very much. Trevor? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. <clears throat> I must say, um, uh, within the bounds of, of tact and diplomacy, let's say, you guys have been pretty forthright, and I'm glad to see that and to listen to you. Uh, because there, there's things being stated now and coming out of the open which have been obvious but unstated for a long time. Uh, you, you might think that in a system where you have 67,000 empty places out of 320,000, that's about one in five, uh, that, that everybody involved, 
sectoral or otherwise, would recognise the necessity and the benefits of, of doing something fairly radical. But and, and going back to when the minister first announced um, <coughs> a, a serious intention to deal with area-based planning, um, it's, it's been downhill ever since, hasn't it? I mean, the, the, the viability audits, the fact that he told the CCMS and the boards to work together when plainly they were never going to and they haven't. Uh, I mean, area-based planning surely must lead to cross-sectoral mergers. It, it just, you look at the geography of Northern Ireland, look at the rural geography in particular, <coughs> and that, that is <coughs> effectively if people had a bit of wit, the, the only sensible solution. And, uh, you know, but, but, but the road we seem to have gone down ever since is, uh, yes, we, we commissioned all this area-based planning stuff, but now it's anything but area-based planning. So now we're coming up with building a united community leading to area learning communities, leading to shared campuses, local solutions, anything but the obvious, which is to reduce the number of schools and not, not allow the sectors to be so protective of their own positions. Find a question there. <laughs> 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 really, I'm, I'm, I just get so depressed by all this because <laughs> as I've told you to find a question, I'm going to go on again. <laughs> 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 really, you know, the, the sectors have been allowed to have been allowed to dictate this process, and there hasn't been an overarching. Dare I mention, Easter, there hasn't been an overarching authority to give it some some legs and some impetus. Well, and we still have, um, and I, and, I mean, let me say, I have no problem with faith schools or control schools, but, you know, they, they, they cannot be allowed to, to continually defy logic, because the way we're going, if in, in 10 or 20 years' time, we, we will still have 1,200 schools, and we'll still have 60,000 empty desks, and the only thing that will change that will be the birth rate. I don't know what to ask. <laughs> well, I suppose the, to give you your question, yeah. to be presumptuous <laughs> myself, is the question is, you know, why isn't area-based planning lo leads, leading to a reduction of schools and an increase of schools which are open and are seen to be open to, be, to everybody? That's ultimately your, your question, yes? Yeah. And the, the, I mean, I'd, I'd say a number of things. I mean, what, what, I would, what, I would, what I would suggest in terms of the process, and you mentioned ESA, you know, the education and library boards themselves are you know, we know, and I don't want to comment on individual boards, but there is an issue of staffing <coughs> educational library boards, and they've been given a task which is very complex to do at a time when they believed they were in a transition to ESA. So that's, you know, an excuse as such and being very positive about the educational library boards, and there's a lot of hard work being done in the boards by a lot of officials. I think that needs to be recognised. In terms of the direction of travel, um, and... You know, in terms of shared education, we might disagree whether the end of a potential shared education route is to have one school. And um, Chris has mentioned um, you know, Bally and the Hinch, where you've got two schools that work very closely <coughs> together. We would see a huge outcome of the area-based planning process to be more and more of those intersectoral partnerships. Um, and then, of course, it's up to local communities to decide what will be the end game for those schools in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And that's not for us to direct at the moment. We have a clear policy direction at the moment, and we would hope that area-based planning would stop looking at a map which has maintained scores on it and a map that has controlled scores on it and not looking at where the maps overlap. And I think our suspicion is at times the way the maps overlap and the, the, you know, the, the cross-sectoral partnerships that are mentioned are mentioned in potentially two cases. They're mentioned in cases where they are so obvious that you cannot miss them. And we all know of the, of the, you know, the number of partnerships around, around the country that clearly are everybody knows about and you have to mention them because the two schools have worked together for so long. Or they're in a situation where one of the managing authorities couldn't come up with another. It was the last case. What there isn't is it's a matter of course. So what wasn't done within area-based planning is that the first thing that people did when they sat down was looked at a, at, at a solution that might be cross-sectoral and include a situation there where you were bringing the communities together. And I think if we were, you know, and it's very difficult, it's very easy to say, you know, if we could go back and change, 
If we were starting this process now, given the policies that we have, I think we would be putting shared education in terms of cross-community collaboration and social economic collaboration further at the top of the list, rather than almost being an add-on bolt-on like you get with your mobile phone. And I think... Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, um, I, so sometimes people think I'm some sort of an opponent of shared education. I'm not, absolutely not. But it has its place. If you have two viable schools or four viable schools in an area uh, who are having difficulty in delivering the full curriculum, well, then there's a place for shared education arrangements. But it did say viable. If, 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 if they're not necessarily viable, well, then shared education shouldn't be an excuse for not taking the radical solution, uh, radical decisions that, 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 that should be necessary. I mean, I can't, I mean, uh, but going back to the sectors, I mean, uh, if we had no sectors, area-based planning would be easy. This would be an, solved quite easily. Yet we, we have sectors who, and they take the, uh, the maintained sector for a start. The, the bishops tell us, told us at this committee sitting there, that um, they're, they're not schools for Catholics. They are Catholic schools. The control sector says the same thing. Our schools are open to everybody. So what's, what's the problem? If, if, if they're both prepared to accommodate all faiths or none. What, what, theoretically at least, should be the problem with, with trying to work together? And the, 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 the problem is that they're, they're being allowed to get away with it and have been for donkey's years, have been since the formation of the state, frankly. And uh, I, I, see, I see no indication at the moment. It's, it's like everything else, frankly, about this place. It just gets kept. Push, push it down the pipe, forget about it. Come up with area-based planning, but don't don't go too hard at it, you know. And uh, I, I, sorry, I know I keep on making these rants, not asking you a question, but really, it, this this to me, this this process is going nowhere. And what the valuable contribution that you're making in this to highlight that fact. I, mean, I, I think uh, Mark, you also said that you didn't like to be critical of particular boards. Well, I, I have no problem with being critical of the Western Education Library Board. When I look at the solutions in your report that have been proposed, which are cross-sectoral, and they don't even appear in the area plan, and then you discover that behind the scenes, the Western Board is, is working with some other solution, which is intra-sectoral. What, what does that say about their genuine desire to bring about a proper area-based solution? I, I know what it says, but I'll probably get disciplined of a said so. Well, I, mean, <coughs> I will try and find a question, but uh, I mean, just, just some observations on, on your comments there. I mean, I think the area planning process seemed at the time to be a very logical, well-intentioned okay. route to take, and I think people who were involved in that process were doing it for all of the right reasons. I think clearly it would have been helpful if ESA would have been involved, not, you know, not to make any political statements about ESA, but simply as a composite body, it would have been a much easier route for that to have been uh, delivered through. The other thing that I would say is um, I don't think we should lose focus from the fact that all of this was about raising education standards. You know, I think we can, whilst collaboration and our experience of that is a route to achieve that, I don't think the original goal here was about, you know, collaborative provision, about addressing parallel education systems and so, so on, however much that might be a good thing to do. So, you know, I think all of those kind of potential collaborations, shared, shared solutions, the end product here should be about raising education standards, and you know I think anything that's done under area planning should have that end goal in sight. Thank you, Chairman. Yep. Thank you, Chair, and thank you. Um, I think it's probably just worth making the point as well about the number of responses, the, the over forty-nine thousand. <coughs> I suppose highlighting the the strength of of opinion that's there. And, and it's right and it has been commented on that your report is what I would call critical in, in relation to the language that's been used there around um, not a bottom-up approach to consultation, that it's tokenistic, um, that in some cases particularly in the Western Board area 
And one of the examples was given was in and around Lamavati, where there's only 16 per cent of respondents who favoured the original proposals, and none of that uh, seemed to have been taken on board. It would seem to suggest that, as you, you rightly alluded, Colin, that ESA in place would have been a better delivery vehicle um, for, for the process. But in terms of the strategic context, I know you've outlined that, because I'm, I'm hearing two messages, that there's an issue about the objective, which was about raising educational standard, but that that became reduced as a result of the three criteria. And then I'm hearing what you're saying, Mark, that there's a very clear policy change. So I suppose my question is, well, first of all, A, in relation to Colin, your point, what needs to happen in terms of that criteria being enforced around raising educational standards? And B, Mark, in, in your comment, well, if there's a clear policy change, has it not been implemented? And who's responsible for not implementing yeah, they're very searching questions, and uh, let me try and at least uh, make a stab at answering. I mean, I think in terms of the raising education standards, um, our own work around collaboration uh, provides some early evidence that where schools are collaborating, then they're more likely to give a wider curriculum choice. As a consequence of that, then kids are more likely to be able to pick subjects that they feel they can excel in. As a result of that, then I think uh, you're more likely to raise education standards. Now, part of what we're doing is still embryonic in the sense that these partnerships, these collaborative partnerships have not been working that long. They have been funded from external sources. They have not been a part of any DE funding and so on. So we would like to continue with that kind of model. But we do think that if you've got cr cross-community collaborative provision, there is a real potential here, I think, in addressing the two most difficult, probably intractable problems at this stage to crack in education. One is about uh, raising education standards, reducing that performance gap. And the second one, I think, is about addressing uh, essentially two parallel systems. So our if you like, solution very much in inverted commas is that based on the work that we've done so far and the practicalities of working mm -hmm. with schools, and my colleagues will be able to speak to this more than I can, we think there's real potential through collaboration, shared education, not only to raise education standards, but also to address the issue that, that Trevor raised. I mean, and I think on raising standards, you know, in, <clears throat> in your constituency, there's a great example whereby there was a, a post primary school that had a very particular issue that was identified. Um, by the inspectorate that was working in collaboration uh, with another post-primary school who happened to have uh, some expertise here. Uh, uh, and so there was no real contact between pupils. It wasn't about that. It was professionals engaging in, uh, in sort of the sharing of what they do and, and the devising of new strategies. And as a result of that, it, which was you know, cost-neutral for the department, the department weren't involved, ETI weren't involved. This was, this was principals and heads of the department off their own bat doing this and being quite you know, honest and vulnerable by saying, listen, we've got an issue here, we think you can help us, please come and help, and staff buying into that. Within a, within a very short period of time, uh, a kind of an, an inadequate uh, provision was, was changed to outstanding, and that's cost neutral, but again, as I referred to earlier on, I'm not terribly sure that the system is set up to recognise that, despite the fact that it brings huge value to, at the end of the day, the pupils are now accessing provision that is outstanding as opposed to inadequate. Uh, and that, we need to find a mechanism whereby principals and school leaders are encouraged to be open and honest uh, and, and seek help from you know, colleagues and peers, in, in effect. Um, you know. yeah, I mean, it, what, what Alistair's ought to be talking about is, you know, we're talking about delivering communities of practice, where you've got teachers having relationships together and transferring knowledge and experience and then developing the next practice together. And that's a key area where you lead to improving education, educational outcomes. Yes, it's about wider provision, and it, but it's also about linking teachers together. And we would all know, and we've all heard um, comments from teachers saying, well, I've walked past this school for the last 20 minutes on my way to work, and I've never been in. 
and then all of a sudden you've got them working together. And what they realise is that they have common needs. And you know, any professional knows that if you're in a, you can be quite isolated within, even within your own organisation. That sometimes when you're linked with another, you can actually open up in a different way. So I think that, and that then leads into your your second question, which was in terms of policy change. And Alistair has alluded to that. What we need in many policies, but certainly in terms of this, the, the one we talked about now, shared education, you do need it to feed into all areas of the department. Whereas, where in the past it may have sat in that community relations cred area of the department, it now leads to feed into ETI, how ETI, and I think there are moves there since the Minister's statement on the 22nd of October. There are clear moves from the department because of course the department now has something to, and you can't ask the department to apply a policy two years ago that they have now, and so there's no criticism there, but I think where we are now is something needs to happen. And I mean, I think, Sean, you asked the question, should we stop? Stop is a very brave word in, in any situation, certainly when you've invested a lot of time. But I think we should certainly refocus and we should look at where we are and look at what are the key objectives that we want out of this process. Because I think we may have lost our way somewhat. Just be with a follow-up to that. Yep. Uh, just, I, no, I noted um, that you would referred to the need to ascertain from the area planning group through the department as to their support for alternative uh, area plans. I think that's something that, that, that you know, we, should, we should look at. But are you likely to put forward... I'm just conscious that the Minister has indicated that this is a process mm -hmm. and that alternative proposals and solutions are welcomed. Will, will there be a formal submission from yourselves to the department or maybe that's having a matter. I don't know what I mean I, I'm not sure Colin mm -hmm. can talk but um, I think we're unsure at the moment of what the process is is in with engaging with what Colin has, has called the super committee so there isn't a process where that can happen and because the, in, in terms of the post primary you know those plans are there now and they are now looking at the plans I think that's the issue that we have there but I think I think there is an opportunity certainly given the minister steer on you know, shared education, the United Communities document, an opportunity for that to be opened up because I think there are a lot of schools that would like to talk about those. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think reference to the super committee, maybe just so that we, we, we put it into its context, <laughs> it's the strategic area learning, uh, area planning steering. steering group. And there's correspondence in uh, our packs today where we had written to the Minister in relation to a development proposal and there's comments made and the department also has replied in relation to the work of that steering uh, group so it'll, it'll not make you any wiser but at least gives you the fact your position as to where it's at and can I just conclude because and, and I know we've strayed slightly at, at, at one point maybe on the, the issue of shared education but it's clear that there's a crowded and a confused policy context in which all of this is, is taking place. And, and in our pack today, uh, there, there's a classic example of how the issue of, for example, whether it's in the context of area planning on shared education plays out, where there's a comment from, from uh, Bishop McKeown in relation to an issue which we raised with him about two schools in particular around uh, shared education provision. But he then makes comment about Lissanelli. And this is how he describes Lissanelli. We are all aware of the proposed co-location of separate schools on Lissanelli. However, since we have never had to reflect on the issue of a shared building, NICE, the Northern Ireland Catholic Commission for Education, has currently no views on the design of such shared education arrangements. Now, here we are on the cusp of what is a major financial investment, huge hype around, and it, it was that I was referring to earlier, where I believe that there's a train wreck coming. And here's a key contributor, response, a managing authority for a large section of schools going on to that site. And they describe it as a proposed co-location of separate schools. They ain't shared education. Now, that's only an example. And there are many others, probably from other sectors. But to conclude with, is it, is it the case that you're, you're really contending that the, the, the policy context in terms of area planning has now got so uh, diluted that 
the issue needs to the whole process of area planning needs to be revisited. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair summary, and I think, I mean, alongside the fact that, you know, the, the, the education policy space is a crowded one at the moment, and I think there needs to be yeah. much more alignment between these policies that were brought out at a time when uh, people felt there were well-intentioned good reasons, but at the moment I think there's a, an opportunity, I think, Mark's work, words to, to kind of stand back and say how can we take this forward in a, in a way that ultimately does end up uh, raising school standards and, and addressing this issue of parallel school systems. Thank you. Mark, Colin, Alistair, thank you very much. I have no doubt that your paper will be uh, extremely useful to us as it has been to date. And thank you for your contributions thank thus far. I look forward to working with you in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Members, to move on quickly, we are due to receive a briefing from our, the Special Advisor on Area Planning at next week's meeting. And at the meeting, we are also due to receive a briefing from the, the PI uh, project on shared education. So, it is also my understanding that the Department has informally indicated that the feedback on the primary school area planning consultation will not be available uh, for its officials or from its officials until at least the end of February. And the Department has therefore requested that we delay uh, for its briefing to the Committee on Primary School Area Planning until April. So clearly there is a, a delay in terms of, of that process. That's, and we're happy to, to uh, accept that, that that's where, where we're at on this issue. But just to inform members, that's where we'll uh, go in relation to this. OK. OK, members, we're then going to move on to uh, the uh, issue of the Year 12 GCSE and Year 14 A-level results. Um, it's a briefing from the department. And you'll find uh, the clerk's cover note at uh, pages 115 to 118, and the NISRA document summarising Year 12 and Year 14 results at pages 119 to page 156. And uh, today's uh, briefing will be recorded by Hansard, and we're going to wait on Dr David Hughes. He's the Director of Curriculum Qualifications and Standards, and Dale Heaney. Yes. <coughs> David, thank you. Gail, Gail, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to come to us. Sure, we just lost our decision making call, yeah. they can still hear that. Yes. Okay. <coughs> okay uh, David, we'll ask you to make your comments on the paper and. Uh, We'll take it from there. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, you um, uh, have sought um, a briefing on the, uh, the statistics um, coming with the survey <coughs> annual examination results, um, uh, and Gail will be able to um, talk briefly about some of the, high, the headline uh, 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 figures from that and the headline messages from that. Um, just to uh, remind the committee that this is a, a survey of um, exam results of pupils in uh, year 12 and in year 14, um, and that is to distinguish it from um, the annual the school leavers results, um, which are also collected and upon which um, uh, the system-wide measurement is made of the um, the education system as a whole. Um, I'll pass to Gail um, on the, the key messages from the, from the results. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a briefing today to the committee on the findings of, of this statistical press release, as you say, Year 12 and Year 14 examination performance at post-primary schools in Northern Ireland 2012-13, to 13, which was published on the 12th of December 2013. The data are taken from the summary of annual, annual examination results process, that's the SAER process, which collates summary school level examination data and validates it with the schools. The 2012-13 figures reported in the publication as presented here today are based on information as at 9th of December 2013. This year, for the first time, summary data on pupils with free school meal entitlement was also collected, validated and published in the statistical press release. Therefore, this database provides a very rich source of information, of which I will present the headline figures today. Just one point to note, when I refer to GCSE and A-levels, I'm also including their equivalent qualifications as well. 
So firstly, if we look at the year 12 pupils, there were 22,580 pupils in year 12 eligible for entry to GCSE examinations <coughs> in 2012-13, as included in the returns made by the schools. The majority of these pupils, about 60 per cent, were in non-grammar schools. Over time, there has been an increase in the proportion of pupils achieving five or more GCSEs at grades S star to C, from 71 per cent in 2008-2009 to 80 per cent in 2012-13. During the same time period, there has also been an increase, but at a lower rate, of the proportion of year 12 pupils achieving five or more GCSEs at grades S star to C, including GCSE English and GCSE Maths, and that has risen from 57% in 2008-09 to 61% as reported in the most recent publication. In 2012-13, the achievement gap between the percentage of pupils achieving five or more GCSEs at grades A star to C and those with the same level of qualifications, but also including A star to C in English and Maths, was 18.7 percentage points. This gap has increased by one percentage point since last year, 2011-12, and it is 4.8 percentage points wider than the 13.9 percentage point gap as reported in 2008-2009. Looking at gender differences in year 12 pupils, females generally perform better than their male counterparts. 65% of female pupils in year 12 achieved five or more GCSEs, including the English and Maths, at grades S star to C, compared with 56% of males, a gap of nine percentage points. Analysis by school type shows that in terms of achievement at the end of Key Stage 4, grammar schools have higher attainment in all key performance indicators. In 2012-13, 97% of grammar school pupils in Year 12 achieved five or more GCSEs at grades A star to C, compared to 67% of non-grammar school pupils. This performance gap has shown signs of narrowing in recent years from 53.2 percentage points in 2005-06 to 30.1 percentage points in 2012-13. This is due to the higher rate of increase in the percentage of pupils achieving five or more GCSEs at grades S or to C. In non-grammar schools, there has been an increase of 24.4 percentage points compared to the increase in grammar schools, which has been 1.4 percentage points. As mentioned earlier, the changes to the data collection methodology this year has enabled the department to collect summary data relating specifically to those pupils in year 12 and also year 14 who were entitled to free school meals. A higher proportion of non-free school meal pupils achieved five or more GCSEs at grades S star to C's. That was 83% compared to pupils entitled to free school meals, 63%. This shows a 20.7 percentage point gap. There is a 32.8 percentage point gap if we look at achievement of five or more GCSEs at grades A star to C, including English and Maths. 34% of Year 12 free school male pupils achieved this level, compared with 67% of non-free school male eligible pupils. So this concludes an overview of the Year 12 results. Now I will move on to the Year 14 results, which refer to A-levels and their equivalents. There were almost 13,000 pupils in Year 14 entered for A-level examinations. Almost all, 98% of pupils in the final year of an A-level course of study achieved two or more A-levels at grades A star to E. There was no change in this indicator since 2011-12. 95% of A-level free school male entitled pupils achieved this indicator. Almost three quarters of year 14 pupils, 65%, achieved three or more A-levels at grades A star to C. This is slightly higher than the figure in 2011-12 by 0.4 percentage points. Just over half, 51% of A-level <coughs> free school male entitled pupils achieved this indicator. 
Females in year 14, as in year 12, generally perform better than their male counterparts. 68% of female pupils in year 14 achieved three or more A-levels at grades A star to C, compared to 62% of males. A greater proportion of year 14 pupils attend grammar schools, 62%, than non-grammar schools, 38%. This contrasts with the year 12 cohort, where 41% attend grammar schools and 59% attend non-grammar schools. Grammar schools had a higher percentage of pupils gaining three or more A-levels at grades A star to C than non-grammar schools. In 2012-13, 77% of grammar school pupils in year 14 achieved this standard, compared to 45% in non-grammar school pupils. This performance gap has shown signs of decreasing in recent years. In 2009-10, the gap between grammar and non-grammar achievement of three or more A-levels at grades A star to C was 34.7 percentage points. In 2012-13, the gap is now 31.8 percentage points, the same as in 2011-12. This reduction in the performance gap and the percentage of pupils achieving three or more A-levels at grades A star to C is due to an increase in achievement at non-grammar schools by 2.4 percentage points and a decrease of 0.5 percentage points in achievement in grammar schools between 2009-10 and 2012-13. So this presentation has provided an overview of the headline information that is contained within the statistical release Year 12 and Year 14 examination performance at post-primary schools in Northern Ireland 2012-13. There's a lot more information included in the report within the text, charts and tables, which is readily available on the department's website. Thank you. No questions and obviously we can get into the minutiae of, of statistics and if you're a statistician, this is just a world that you just love to, to be in uh, and I'm not a statistician. But if, if you look at, uh, at uh, table 11 of uh, your presentation, of the Nizzer report, there seems to be an issue, and, and I don't know why, and I would just like to see if you have any, could shed any light on it. Non-grammars in the southern, western and northeastern board areas do better in five GCSEs, including English and Maths, and also three A-levels than those in the Belfast and the South Eastern Board. And that's uh, Table 11, page 143 for members. Is, is there any, any explanation as to why that is the case? Or is it an urban-rural split? I'm not sure. I certainly haven't seen any analysis which has indicated any reason, um, but it's a question that, that is worth uh, exploring. Because just in, in, in the context of, of all, it goes back to, slightly back to what we were discussing earlier on with our previous presentation about this a policy uh, mix that there is at the minute with the department and the statistics and we have area planning and we have sustainable schools and we have all sorts of things going on out there. It's a real cauldron. Uh, there, there seems to be a, a variation and it's, it's, it's particularly in the southern, western and northeastern board as opposed to the Belfast and the southeastern. Would you maybe just not now, if, mm. uh, uh, and David, what you're saying, I uh, hear what you're saying, but would you give it some consideration and maybe try and, and give us maybe some indication as to what your view would be as to the reason why that might be? Certainly, it's, yes, it is a question worth exploring, um, and there may be a number of different directions yes. in which that can be taken. Yeah. Okay. So. The other one is, the, the data also shows a large attainment gap between free school and pupils who attend at grammar schools and those who do not. We've, we've seen that, and that's been reported. But I wonder, can the department explain why free school meals is taken to be a good proxy for educational underachievement, as NISRA's data would appear to show that the best indicator 
for educational underachievement is prior attainment. Why, does, why is there a seemingly difference between those two from the department's point of view? Well, I think, I think it would be important to make the distinction. There is the distinction between measuring those, who, those pupils who are free school meal entitled and those pupils who are underachieving. Um, the fact is that um, the figures would show that children who are free school meal entitled are more likely to be underachieving. It's not to say that they are underachieving necessarily. Um, likewise, there may well be pupils who are underachieving, but their achievement is not low achievement, um, and nor are they you know, uh, uh, um, in any particular position of social deprivation, but they are underachieving, and that is the kind of thing that a, a school will be aware of looking at their prior attainment um, and their expectation for that, uh, for that child. So we don't um, make an absolute correlation between free school meal entitlement and underachievement, but there is a strong connection between those two because pupils who are free school meal entitled are more likely to underachieve. And is that exemplified when you look at the attainment gap for free school meals, pupils narrows at A-levels. And it raises this issue around why we continually bound the statistics by age at very fixed points in the age process, whereas some pupils will clearly, as these figures will indicate, achieve better later. Well, that's, I mean, that's uh, coming back to, to what I was saying uh, very early on, is why we have these figures which are about uh, examination results and are uh, year 12 and year 14. But the actual measurement of this, the system uh, is based on school leaver results, which I think is, is, is responding exactly to the point you're making. It is far fairer to look at how uh, the system has served the individual at the point at which they leave the system, yes. um, uh, which, is, uh, which I think is only fair, to be honest. How, from, from the department's point of view, David, and maybe this is an unfair question, because it would require a, a policy context, which is uh, maybe is, is a, a political decision, but what could be done to have, and it, it's not about because it's always a bit like the police trying to change the rules for reporting crime, because you're always wondering, are they just doing this solely that the figures will look good, but there's still maybe as many crimes and as many criminals out there. But it is, what is the best, or, or what could be done, that would give us a fairer reflection than maybe where we're currently at, or more accurate reflection, of how the system has served the individual? not the individual served the institution, in the, but have it in that right way. What could be done? Is the issue about moving the, the time when examinations are taken by some pupils? Is it having that flexibility in the system? Have you any...? I think there are a number of, there are a number of different ways in which um, performance can be measured. Some are relatively easy. Um, and whenever you take one performance measure in isolation from others, you inevitably only get part of the story. And I know that um, uh, certainly what um, I hear from head teachers is uh, many schools who say, what we want to see measured is the progress from performance on that child's arrival at the school to when they leave. Um, and that's... Uh, I mean, that's, that's a desire, I think, generally held, and that should become uh, possible once the, uh, the assessment at the end of each key stage um, is embedded. And we can say, well, this child performed in, uh, at this level um, at, key st at the end of uh, key stage one, the end of key stage two, the end of key stage three, and you can see the progression. Um, and also, and that is, and here are the, that, here are the, the child's performance at uh, GCSE or equivalent uh, qualifications at 16, and here is the performance later. I mean, and then, in actual fact, what we're saying is we've already got a, the end point measurement, which is performance on leaving school. Um, but to have that progression 
um, would be a very valuable a very valuable element of it. Of course, we also um, the performance measurement also has sort of set points, and so in in this figures of these these figures, obviously we often are looking at um, five or more GCSEs or equivalents at A star to C, including English and maths. So we have this five or more. There's also a seven or more. At A levels, it's two or three. Um, but there are a number of other different places at which one could draw a line and say, well, it'd be very interesting to see how they're doing at the very top end. What are the A and A star figures, for example? But also, what about those who, to be honest, um, performance at any level at level two, or even performance at any level at level one, they have got a qualification which they may not otherwise have got if they hadn't been served so well by the school they're in. There is the whole range of, uh, as it were, points at which you could measure. Um, and uh, I think to be perfectly candid, the more points at which you're measuring, the less likely you're going to be um, uh, affecting the way in which the school is thinking about the performance of pupils. But ultimately, the problem that we face with the current system is that ultimately a school in terms, and this is where the, the, the challenge comes to, to decipher and to separate the school from the individual, while it's, uh, they are inseparably uh, and inextricably linked. Uh, but the school is judged by five GCSEs in terms of how it performs and whether or not it will survive, even though within that there will be people who have progressed very, very well from when they entered the school, but yet they didn't get five, but they got three. In some cases, they may only get two, but for that individual pupil to get two was a huge achievement. But the overall context, and I've been to a school in my own constituency that was deemed and is deemed by the department to be a failing school, and that pupil has got seven GCSEs A star to C. An outstanding achievement for that pupil, and, and it, it's that. Yeah, I think I think we need to need to be quite careful about how we say that, that schools are being evaluated and by whom, because of course the the principal method of school evaluation is inspection, which looks at the entire range of of um, the, the provision in the school, uh, and not just as it were a single performance measure based on GCSE or equivalent qualifications. Um, and so uh, I think, I think that's, that is a, a, a critical element of this as well. An inspector going into a school will be able to say, we look at their in, the school's intake, we look at the quality of the teaching and the leadership, and if we were to be so callous as only to look at their examination results, we could be cr very critical, but in actual fact, we know what this school is doing. It is doing a magnificent job. And that's the value of the inspection uh, process, is that, that that wide evaluation of the school, uh, of school performance is, is possible. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> um, Perhaps just to turn to <coughs> figure seven. 126 in, in, in RPACs. It's about the gap, I suppose, in the improvement between the grammars and, and the non-grammar uh, sector. Um, it's, again, it highlights the, you know, the very commendable um, you know, success in the non-grammar sector over the last number of years. Does the, maybe it's a, a loaded term, but does the coasting of the grammar sector at that particular level reflect um, a coasting per se, or can that be taken to 100? Is there, is there an acceptable level of achievement at a certain level that is near, near impossible to go above? Or you know, what can be done to take that up higher and, and to continue the growth in, in the, in the non-grammar sector without asking too many loaded questions? <laughs> I think it would be, <clears throat> I think it's worth looking at that uh, figure in, alongside, now I'm not gonna be able to find it, of course, the one which demonstrates um, that um, the size of the grammar se sector has remained stable, even while the, population, the, the school age population has dipped. I mean, um, to characterize it crudely, the grammars fell up first. Um, and so the population in the non-selective sector is growing smaller. The logic of that is that the population in the grammar sector is broadening in terms of their, uh, their, their potential, uh, academic potential and their, or educational potential. So that table, figure seven, 
is a tremendous endorsement of what the non-selective sector is doing in improving results with a population of children who are the best are being creamed off already, and yet their results are being improved. I mean, that's, that is, a, is very impressive. At the same time, it's saying something about the grammar sector, is that the, not in all grammar schools, I'm sure, but in many, the, the breadth of the, um, uh, the educational ability of, this, of the pupils in the school is growing, and they're sustaining their performance. Um, so there will always be those who criticize um, uh, the department and others for going on and on about standards and res results and performance and so on. Um, but that's because the public expects performance and results. And here we see that there is a positive impact in both sectors, that both are seeking to do the best for the, for the, the children um, in their sectors. John? Thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome. I suppose to go back to a point that the Chair made earlier, you know, when you talk about evaluating schools, parents evaluate schools by results. You know, they don't look into the prior attainment and so on. And how can this more accurately reflect the, the performance of the school? Because you did talk about the, level, the levels of a progression. How can the levels of progression at the end of Key Stage 2 be a more sort of accurate instrument in terms of being a baseline for um, Key Stage 3? Really what I'm getting at is seeing the value added in schools, because I think we all agree that many non-selective schools make fantastic progress to get the, the statistics, and because it's on Chris' point. And I suppose the other point, and it's made by uh, uh, somebody presented a couple of weeks ago, how do we measure the holistic education, you know, all the other aspects <coughs> that make a school a good school? Um, that's, my, that's my first point. Well, I, I, don't, I don't deny that um, the public at large, the easiest and quickest way of assessing performance of a school um, is looking at the exam results. And I'm sure that most people looking at exam results will also be filtering what those exam results really mean. Yes, this grammar school has got tremendous results, but the other message is, well, of course they should do, shouldn't they, given their intake? Um, I think an increasingly sophisticated assessment of schools and encouraging that and enabling that is, is enormously valuable. Um, and I think also, to be, I mean, be, be completely topical, these are the weeks in which parents of P7 and P6 pupils are going into schools and looking at them and they're listening to the head teacher and they're listening to teachers and pupils and they are evaluating far more than just the exam results by looking closely at the school and that's very, that is a very telling exercise. The point about um, the levels of progression, I think there is a real, uh, a real necessity <coughs> for um, allowing and enabling the assessment at the end of each key stage to take place, to be um, embedded in the practice of schools and a very, very important element of that is for post-primary schools to understand how it is done at the end of key stage two. And what, to be perfectly frank, what the P7 teacher is doing, giving a, a level four to so-and-so, so that the year eight teacher understands precisely what that means when they see so-and-so level four. I think that communication an understanding of how the levels of progression are assessed and what they mean for the teachers at the different stages in, in the different phases is absolutely critical to ensuring that being able to measure progression so that a child does move from level to level either at the expected rate or indeed at a faster rate um, but not at a slower rate. And I think, I think that is perfectly possible, but it is quite um, a shift in practice and is quite a shift in emphasis, which I think needs to be encouraged and supported. 
But do you not think, do you not think, you know, there's two things there. A level four in school A and level four in school B might necessarily be the same thing. And there's a large variation within level four, particularly in English, across the, across the band. Do you not feel that um, post-primary schools need a lot more information than just the level? I think, I, think, I mean, you put your finger on a, on a very important point, and it's a point that I've certainly heard made to me on a number of occasions, that the, the, the levels are very broad levels. Um, and I think there is certainly an argument that they may be of more value at, for different purposes to have a greater degree of differentiation between them. Um, and that's something that's certainly worth bearing in mind. Um, at the same time, um, a very, very, a more granular approach to the levels may be more information than is strictly necessary at other, for other reasons that that data is collected. For the individual child, it may be very important to know, well, are they doing, you know, are they solidly, you know, right at the, doing the best within level four, or are they just scraping into a level four because they've demonstrated just about, you know, enough? I can see that the individual child's level, that may be enormously valuable for that child, their parents and the teachers who then take them the following year or whatever. Um, there may be an argument that it's valuable at school level. Um, the argument certainly falls away um, at a system level um, when looking at, uh, you, know, you know, broadly what proportion of children are reaching level four, level five, level three, whatever. So, I mean, I, I mean you make a, a very, uh, very valid point. And a, a, another one, in terms of tracking uh, free school, children and free school meals, you said there's a different method of collecting or organising your data now. C can you track um, achievement of students with free school meals irrespective of their, the school that they, they attended? Uh, you know, what I'm saying, for example, are there tables out there of free school meals, children who attended non-selective schools as opposed to free school meals, children who attend at grammar schools of their achievement? Okay. The information that we've collected this year for the, for the first time does allow us to identify the qualifications of the pupils who are free school meals. So we cannot say pupil A got these qualifications, pupil B got another set of qualifications. But we, what we can say is in summary, all free school meal and title pupils receive these qualifications. So from that perspective, we can report on a, the qualifications of those pupils in a particular school with their free school, uh, in a particular school who are entitled to free school meals. So it can be broken down, depending on the school type? Depending yeah. on the school type, and we are only able to do that information, provide that information because of the, the change to the methodology of collection this year. I think that, that would be useful. I'd like to see that. And then, you. You mentioned two, um, in brackets we have, or equivalents. Um, what percentage of our GCSE subject passes are equivalent subjects rather than the GCSEs? And what's, could you just elaborate on those? What, when we talk about equivalents, what, what are the main qualifications? I'm not sure that we would have the percentages for you, although we could, we could try and, and um, come back to the committee with, with that information. Um, certainly, there's an increasing um, trend, I think, towards those equivalent qualifications, uh, particularly given their, the value that some schools would see in terms of further progression uh, opportunities. Um, I, I would still uh, estimate, based on the figures that I have seen, that GCSEs and L's you know, are, are predominantly the, the main factor, but, but the, the sort of qualifications that seem to be increasing in, in popularity tend to be the BTECs, for example, as one of the vocational routes. Uh, but there are also uh, level one qualifications and, um, that uh, lead into level two qualifications, uh, which ultimately lead on to a GCSE. Which, which would be you know, relatively high in number. We can try and break that down for you, if that would be useful, uh, and try and get some percentages for you. Thank you. That's been useful. Thank you. Go on. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> can, can I ask, um, how do you feel the increasing proportion of Year 12 pupils, which was 7% in 2012-2013, is that correct? Um, 
who were ineligible for inclusion in the Year 12 figures impact on the overall picture? And how many in total was that? Seven percent. Sorry, can you point to the? the I'm just trying to get why those um, pupils were excluded. The seven percent that it was clarified. I'm trying to think of the pages now. Seven percent ineligible for inclusion in the Year 12 figures. Um, the, oh, the, um, the exemptions from yeah. uh, from inclusion. 122, I think it is. Approximately 7% of the overall year 12 cohort were deemed ineligible for inclusion in the summer of annual examinations results returns in 2012-2013. So 7% is how many pupils? I don't have that information with me today, but it, it can be provided. Yeah. Yeah. One, two, two, I think it is. One, two, two, yeah. yeah. There are eight exemptions in total that schools uh, could determine to exempt the pupil uh, for, from the statistics uh, for, for a number of reasons. Those exemptions include uh, people dying, people being pregnant or being ill, uh, having special educational needs, um, being uh, thought to be um, best managed through EOTIS. Um, and so on, so that there, we can certainly provide the committee with a list of those exemptions. But that explore how the exclusions do they give a full picture? You know, those exclusions. Did you say there's eight categories there's eight for total, yeah. exclusion? Um, it would be useful, Chair, sure, maybe if we had the seven percent, the, the numbers. You, you, yes. you don't have those figures. With me today. Uh, okay. And has that increased in recent years? I believe it has. Yeah. And have we any idea? Again, that would be useful because it does have an impact. Now, and I think where, where you're going, Joanne. Allude to if we have the exact. So yeah, there's the impact. Increasing concern for, for us. I think that um, the, the the capacity for for schools to exempt certain pupils yes. does does vary from school to school, and uh, we're certainly keen to try and identify uh, the reasons for that and. and uh, and you're right, the trend has increased, um, I think it was from 4.5% to 7% over recent years. Um, so, useful for us to know the reasons mm -hmm. why they were excluded, yeah. and it would help form yeah. a, a broader picture as well behind I'm it. pretty sure we can get that for you. Yeah. That would be useful. And if you look at, at the reasons for exclusion, SEND plays a part of it. Yeah. If you take that there has been an increase both in you know, in post primary provision, select mm -hmm. and non select. There's been an increase in SEM pupils. Is there a correlation you know are, are there some schools who find it convenient to be able to exclude some people because they happen to be on the SEN register? And are they being particularly penalised? <coughs> Uh, I, I, think, no. I think it's. I'm, 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 I'm wading into an area which I'm, I'm not absolutely confident no, but in, but be, I, I, think I think it's David quite. It would be keen, it would be interesting if the department could give some, and I think Dale uh, has, has an idea of what, where I'm going with it that, you know, it's in some schools' interest that they would have better outcomes. But if you I, could, if you can. I wouldn't want to say manipulate the figures because that might be too blunt. But if you can certainly, I'm not saying you said it. <laughs> by the process, if it allows you to have exemptions, mm -hmm. are those exemptions <coughs> validated enough to underpin the legitimacy of the first of the outcomes that are being reported? But more importantly, where does it leave those young people? And that, for me, has always been an issue about schools, whatever sector they're in, who determine that there are some pupils who are, listen, you would be better not doing A, B and C. Why? Is that for the best of the pupil or for the better outcome for the institution? So it would be interesting to see what more light you might be able to shed on that day. I think, I think it's worth, um, and I will correct myself if I've got this wrong, but um, a, a, a pupil with special education needs is not necessarily exempted. Um, uh, but there, there would be those special educational needs that it would actually be fair on the, fair 
to exempt. Yes. Um, so I think it's worth. But it could be on whose, on the basis of what objective criteria can that be determined, and not just on the basis of there's a get out clause here that we could maybe use. Uh, it, it, it's it's trying to protect the pupil. Ultimately, that's what we want to be pretty sure of. Yeah. Okay. I, I definitely would like clarity around those eight categories, in particular on the same, which is sure. we're not getting an accurate picture, and it would certainly help. So um, I think I've opened a can of worms maybe with that. I'm glad I did. Um, can, I, can I ask uh, as well, um, just finally, the 2012-2013 figures in your briefing, they're based on information up to the 9th of December 2013, is that correct? As, yeah. as page 154, yes. um, pack point six of our briefing. Um, are they likely to have changed since? <coughs> and if they have, what margin do you think? Do you expect they will have changed? That was the date that uh, the, the database closed. Uh, obviously, you have to close the database at some, at some time in order to run the analysis in order to, to, to write the report. Um, at Is this, there any information of changes since then? At this, at this point, no. No, we don't okay. have any so information. Even, would you envisage? margin have changed? Would you have any idea based on those statistics, those patterns? No? No. Um, unless a school were to inform us that there has been a change. The, the, the data collection methodology, um, we request the information at the start of the year, at the start of the academic year from, from the school and they provide it to us, they give us a return. Then we, we draft uh, a summary table set of summary tables which we then send to the school and ask them to confirm that these figures are accurate and whenever we get a, a, a signed a uh, return that is signed off by the principal then those are the figures that we use and that would be the most up-to-date information that we have received from the school so um, you have no I guess work even how they, they've changed I'm just trying to explore how are they likely to change more with GCSE or A level results we'll just be curious to find out changes since then is there any way of getting us that information? Or? It's, not, it's not that this, this survey then is updated in, to reflect um, remarks or anything like that. I mean, that's the point. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think it, and, and again, do stop me if I'm getting this wrong, but the school leavers data is the qualifications that the pupil leaves school with. And that does, that is much later, it comes much later in the year, because it does capture the actual final set Just of qualifications. It would be useful if it was ongoing that we could get the projections and how things are changing rather than, you know, the, uh, understand, but the cutoff at that particular 9th of December, it would, be, it would be useful, I think, for us as a committee to explore how they are changing as, uh, you know, as time goes on, but I guess you don't have that information. No, and it would have to, it would have to be sought again specifically to have a second survey, presumably. Yes, I did. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I think there's any other questions. Uh, David, Dale, Gail, thank you very much for your attendance. Thanks for your assessment and for your commitment to provide some additional information. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, moving on uh, to uh, I think just following on from that, there's obviously information that the, that the department will come back to as well, which could be useful. So we'll wait to that when it comes. Move on then to uh, correspondence. And uh, correspondence is at 259 to 331, with 13 items provided uh, and one tabled item. At page 285, you'll find a response from the Department to the Committee's request for an update on the production of a circular relating to the establishment of school councils. The Department has provided the Committee with a draft circular which provides guidance for principals and Board of Governors on how to encourage people participation in decision-making in schools, including through uh, the process of school councils. The guidance appears to be in line with the Committee's recommendations from the inquiry which the uh, previous committee had undertaken, and uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, useful. I think it's good to see that the department did take on board uh, a piece of work that was carried out by the committee in relation to the issue of uh, school councils. Any comment? Okay. So are we content to endorse the, the circular? Okay. Thank you. Page 318. Uh, we have 
uh, and also on tabled items, we have information about enhanced disclosure certificates. And I think the Department has set out its position uh, clearly. Enhanced disclosure certificates have to be renewed if there is a break in employment or more than three months, or four of the Education and Library Boards have confirmed that they comply with the Department's guidance in this regard. The Enhanced Disclosure Certificate gives the necessary level of detail on convictions, barring and relevant intelligence, and therefore assures or is an assurance to schools in respect of new employees. The cost of the applicant is £30 for each renewal. So what I would suggest is we write to the Department and ask how relevant convictions, barrings and intelligence are notified to schools or ELBs for existing employees. Trevor? Is this an issue you heard? Um, yeah, I've, I've read the Department's uh, letter. Um, I, I imagine that our, what they call regulated activity is virtually anything that happens within the school. Um, the, the problem with these music tutors, as, as I understand it, is that they, 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 they come and go. You know, they don't do a, a whole school year yeah. and take the summer off and then restart again in September the way ordinary teachers do. Uh, they're, they're provided by the agencies, by the different bodies uh, according to the needs of the school. It could be a particular instrument, you know. Um, and they may only do a couple of months or a few weeks. And it could be over three months before they're called in again to a different school. So, and I think there's this constant repetition and requirement if, if you're over the three months then to, to get another enhanced disclosure certificate, even though you've, you may have, to take it to its logical conclusion, been, been cleared four or five times in the past two years. So, you know, that was, that was the point of the, yeah. the query, and I don't yeah. disagree with what you're suggesting, but. I just think it's, it's perhaps a wee bit over the top. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. And, and I, it's how this. I take the point, and I think that there's merit in what's been said in relation to, you know, having to reapply and, and go through this process because of the nature. And I mean, not only just apply to music teachers. There are parapathetic teachers that come and go in and out of schools. Yeah. And, and it may be something that we should ask, is, is there another way whereby we can still secure satisfaction that all necessary steps are taken to protect the, the pupils in the process, because ultimately that, that I think is paramount, but equally to ensure that uh, there is not a non-due requirement placed on a particular element of the system, in this case music uh, uh, tu uh, tutors. Uh, in having to reapply unnecessarily. And, and I think the Department set out what the, their view is, and we have seen also the correspondence today from, from Justice. As well as that, Chairman, I'm not fully up to speed with this, I don't claim to be, but an enhanced disclosure certificate is a step above the normal vetting procedure. Yeah. So as a kind of a, a double don't here straight away. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see what the response we get. Okay. Uh, any other? Well, there's one other item, and it's in relation to. I just want to raise, and I was only a member wants to raise an issue. It's the correspondence from Colin Reid uh, and uh, NSPCC, and I think I think what Colin suggests, and in that correspondence, he'd be happy to come and have make a presentation to the committee. And you'll see at page two seven nine. And actually, page 280, you have uh, a very detailed reply from the department in relation to the issue of sexual exploitation and the preventative education program. Now, there's, it raises a number of issues around resource training, um, teachers uh, and all, all sorts of things, because obviously it's, it's set in the context of the contribution that the department has made to the prevention strand of the domestic and sexual violence and abuse strategy, which is probably going out for consultation sometime in the new year. I think it wouldn't do is, while the previous issue is related, it's more about 
practice in terms of, of an individual group. I think it might not do us any harm as a committee to have we have this letter which sets out where the department's currently at. It was as a result of the work carried out by the department and the NSPCC in terms of the keeping safe that we saw a lot of things come out uh, recently. It might be useful for us, and I think we had originally, or going back a few months, said that at some stage we would bring uh, NSPCC to the committee, and I think if we can arrange that, it would give us an overview where they're at and, and maybe tie all those things together. Or, is the committee happy? Because I think it's an area that we need to keep ourselves informed. Maeve? Yeah, I think it would be important given the, the ongoing inquiry yes. Yes. Uh, and how education fits yeah. in. Yeah, exactly. Like that, I think it would be important to work. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> any other issues of correspondence? Thank you. Forward work programme, page 333 to 335. Next Thursday evening at uh, 6 p.m., we we are due to have our informal meeting with the district inspectors in room 115. Uh, 24 district inspectors are to attend the event, and I would just encourage members to advise the clerk and the staff about their availability to attend. So it's 6 p.m. next Thursday, the 23rd. Uh, you'll note uh, that there will not be a committee meeting on the 29th of January as we're hosting the STEM is cool event in the Lawn Gallery in conjunction with the Northern Ireland Science Park. Again, can members please advise the clerk about the availability? The time in relation to that? We said that right before. I think it's done by lunchtime, so it will be similar time. It's the same, the similar time to the committee, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay uh, as we're aware, the department was not ready to brief us for the common funding formula consultation scheme on the 4th of December. Mm. They have indicated uh, to us just before Christmas that this may happen sometime in January. So uh, we have no further no, reference. Might mean, might mean an extra meeting, members, just that might happen at short notice. Um, so, but I just have no date this time. Okay. Uh, also, you'll maybe note that in the to be scheduled section, the clerk is endeavouring to arrange an informal lunch for members with departmental officials in Rathgale. I've been waiting since 2004. <laughs> no, it's not as long as that. Uh, to go to Rathgale, it almost seems as long as that. So, uh, we're, a, a suitable date has yet to be agreed. Okay. Uh, I think I think the department has suggested some Sunday, so that we know why not <laughs> why not arrive. Now, I, I say that in jest. And also, uh, to be scheduled, the Department is asked to defer the meeting on proposed revisions of the development proposal guidance, so we'll, we'll have to wait until we get uh, a date for that. Okay, are members content with uh, the revised schedule? And if so, then the meeting will take place next Wednesday, 22nd, at 10am, not 9.30, in this building. Thank you.